the world of film noir is one bound by its own rules and recognized foundations, leaving behind its Hollywood conventions. In noir, evil often triumphs, and it is the good guy who often falls victim. These are protagonists that one would call grey and flawed, characters who are still true to themselves enough to garner sympathy as protagonists, or to use the words of Raymond Chandler, they are knights in dirty armour. Despite this, noir protagonists are often characters that possess clear intentions and know what they want, even though they often demonstrate a naiveness to the situations around them. Film noir emerged after World War II and presented a vision of bleakness and character psychology rarely seen on screen in pre-war times. This was a new cinematic world, one where audiences were now required to sympathise with the criminals and the corrupt. This cultural shift resulted in noir reaching its peak from the 40s through to the late 50s. This huge wave of noir-based storytelling emerged in Hollywood post-war, seeking to capitalise on a collection of stories written by acclaimed writers who were at the height of their powers during the Great Depression, which is the main reason so many great works of noir cinema are based upon literary sources. During the war, Hollywood could be seen presenting a vision of a utopia. Post-war, it sought to confront the many macabre truths about the world, a world that had now seen how uninviting and ugly things could truly get. And as an audience, they were willing to now accept that fact. Even though many filmmakers today will utilise noir tropes and will call their works film noir, can they really be called true film noir if the movement itself relied on the filmmakers' reflections of the world around them? These were filmmakers who didn't know that they were making film noir. This is just a terminology that emerged following a reflection on the era itself. So given this, perhaps it's best to distinguish noir as not a genre, but rather a style and historical movement. One that emerged from the depths of a post-war Hollywood where the highly stylized worlds and distinct cinematic language helped filmmakers to create an ambiguity in American cinema that was never seen before. Although it is still heavily debated, many consider John Huston's The Maltese Falcon to be the first true noir picture, given that noir films are often defined by their implementation of psychological drama. It's clear that Huston's film is one of the crucial early examples of a criminal world that is never defined by its violence. Rather, it is what is off-screen that is more powerful, labyrinthian and subliminally intricate. The Maltese Falcon is one of the true treasures of the 1940s, consisting almost completely of dialogue. Houston manages to make his film flow with unrelenting momentum. Like many of the noirs that would follow, the film relies on its style and stark thematics. With Humphrey Bogart also bringing his name into the public conscious, as a hero for one of the first times in his career, in perhaps his most iconic role. Not only is The Maltese Falcon one of the most influential films from the noir period, it also happens to be one of the era's most fitting entry points. Sexuality, greed and lust are often some of the first identifying factors one will often mention when describing noir. But these are elements of the movement that didn't truly shine through until Billy Wilder's corrupt masterwork double indemnity. 1940s Los Angeles has never looked as smeared and sleazy as it does in Wilder's essential work of film noir, a film that with every viewing grows in grandeur as a definitive example of fatalism on screen. A quintessential tale of murder and infidelity, Wilder's vision of James M. Cain's pulp novel is bolstered by its supreme cast, featuring 40s icons Barbara Stanwyck, Fred McMurray, and of course, a supporting turn by the always captivating Edward G. Robinson. Three actors who would all prove themselves to be defining figures in the genre for the following decade. Key to the film's place within the history of noir is its distinct depiction of McMurray's central character and his descent into darkness as a man who falls victim to his many sexual and violent impulses. Something that although would be echoed by many others in subsequent films, was never conceived or scripted better than it was here. For the first time in Hollywood history, females had begun to be represented as independent characters. Characters that knew what they wanted, and they knew how to get it. If it was you, they'd charge that up to Sacchetti too, wouldn't they? Sure they would. And that's just what's going to happen, baby. Because he's coming here tonight in about 15 minutes. With the cops right behind him. It's all taken care of. Shall we pay them a visit? Like Wilder's Double Indemnity, Laura is a work that continued to demonstrate the power that the female force had on our male noir protagonists. 
These are women who can be seen to have a magical power over men, the a narrative equivalent of a spider casting its web over the criminal world around them. Directed by Otto Preminger, Laura once again finds a detective being drawn into something out of his control, this being the murder investigation for a woman within the Manhattan High Society. However, when the detective begins to fall in love with Laura through a painting in her home, memories and reality start to blend together as he soon realizes that there might be more to the case than he initially thought. One of the most lauded and quintessential noirs of its time, Otto Preminger helms this fatal tale of romantic obsession with masterful precision and authority, effectively capturing this magical essence of feminine power that existed within noir cinema. With hypnotic performances and a technical prowess across the board, there's much to admire in Laura, as Preminger brings forth a complex portrait of desire and mystery to the forefront crafting a thoroughly gripping tale from start to finish. Whilst the major studios continue to venture into the realm of noir, some of the darkest and grungiest works emerge from the depths of Poverty Row, the term used to describe the many short-lived B-movie studios that existed alongside the major studios during the Golden Age. Shot in six days, and made by Poverty Row Studio PRC in 1945. The defining example of this untidy and low-budget type of noir filmmaking was Edgar G. Ulmer's retrospectively acclaimed Detour, a film that aimed to provide a study into the paranoia and dark fatalism that lies at the very core of the noir. In this work, Ulmer tells the story of a gullible and down-on-his-luck hitchhiker who, after making his way from New York to Los Angeles, soon finds himself with a dead body on his hands and nowhere to run. Unsure of his next move, he soon assumes the identity of a man before coming across a mysterious woman who seems to know everything about his true identity. Working with a shoestring budget and with no-name actors at the forefront, Ulmer captures the pulpy and haunting atmosphere of Noir's underbelly quite unlike any other, bringing forth a masterful embodiment of all the movement's themes in this bleak tale of cross-country misadventure that offers us a glimpse into how the power of this noir period extended beyond the confines of the studio system. Love with me. 1945 was somewhat of a crucial year for German auteur Fritz Lang, who with Scarlet Street would craft one of the defining American works, blending a remarkably successful combination of screwball comedy and dark noir derangement to bring forth a new world of comedic and sadistic noir. The master of psyche and shadow Fritz Lang was clearly one of the key expressionist figureheads for the stylistic techniques on display in noir. Like German expressionism, light and shadow exist as their own characters in noir. This is lighting that is never conventional. Instead, it's rather distorted, stark, and slanted. Scarlet Street starred the always enigmatic Edward G. Robinson as the timid and middle-aged cashier Chris Cross. Lang's story of deception begins when he rescues an actress from being mugged, soon causing him to plunge into an unpreventable web of deceit, theft, lust, and even murder. Actually banned in numerous cities across America at the time of its release for the failure of characters to receive orthodox punishment from the police, Lang's tale contains no heroes and features characters who one might consider to be pathetic in nature. It is here that the film's true strength lies, and it is within these flawed characters where Lang is able to explore Scarlet Street's darkest mysteries and secrets. These characters, all living with guilt, regret, and failure, are straight from the very heart of noir cinema, representing the darkest work of Lang's career and one of the quintessential titles of the noir period. Clearly Noir had begun to hit its peak during the late 40s, evidenced once again by what many considered to be the apex of film noir, Jacques Tourneau's Out of the Past, a film that earns its significant reputation, thriving with a subversive nature and trademark exploration of the movement's many tropes and themes. With an elaborate and carefully structured plot spanning two time periods, Tourneur's story mostly told in flashback, follows a former private eye who has escaped his past to run a gas station in a small town. However, when his dangerous past catches up to him, he must return to his previous world of danger, corruption, and femme fatales. The always foreboding and mesmerizing Robert Mitchum stars as the film's central figure, embodying the traits one expects from a noir hero and his constant battle with his own personal demons and dark side. 
Mitchum's character chronicles his tale through narration, something that was often utilised by noir directors to provide the audience with a gateway to these largely unconventional and flawed protagonists. Noir at its foundation has always been about fate, where the audience knows where the narrative is bound to go for these doomed characters, something that was never showcased quite as well as it is here in Tourneau's film and its elaborate flashback structure. Undoubtedly a work worthy of revisitation over the years, out of the past is a noir crafted with tremendous care and precise consideration, one in which every action is valued and orchestrated by Tourneau to further form the structure for his layered mystery. Set in post-war Vienna, Cowell Reed's iconic British noir The Third Man centers on an American who arrives in the city to accept a job with his friend Harry, only to learn that he has died. However, after the man soon begins to suspect that his friend's death may indeed be a conspiracy, he soon decides to stay in Vienna and investigate the incident. With a perfectly cast central ensemble that features underrated leading man Joseph Cotton, alongside the always elusive Orson Welles, the Third Man is a work of British cinema worthy of its praise and reputation. A technical and stylistic landmark in the film noir genre, Reed's captivating investigative tale utilises an atmospheric use of black and white expressionist cinematography. Something brought to life by Australian cinematographer Robert Kraska. Although something often attributed to the movement's psyche, the collapsing world and production design are never more prominent than here. These are sets that almost seem to be closing in on the characters. Here, Carol Reed has infused wartime politics and neorealism into the film noir realm, allowing Graham Greene's razor-sharp screenplay to come to life in mesmerizing and haunting fashion, once again shining a light on noir's concept of fate and how it is always dictated by the character's own decisions, not by inevitability. Coming after a string of early hits at 20th Century Fox, Samuel Fuller would craft arguably his finest noir effort with the Cold War-inspired, pickpocketing delight pick up on South Street. Here once again we can see Fuller clearly focused on exploring America's underbelly and the many overlooked characters and petty criminals that inhabit his worlds. At the centre of this tale is Richard Widmark, who plays Skip McCoy, a seasoned pickpocket who unknowingly snatches a microfilm of top-secret government documents, leading to a series of unpredictable criminal events. Playing the character of Candy, the femme fatale of Fuller's story is John Peters, a woman who once again finds herself drawn into underbelly connections. You can really feel how much Fuller is committed to the immersion of his world within Pick Up on South Street. This is something clear from the affection and portrayal of many of the film's troubled and flawed characters, which truly are some of the richest and ideologically charged of the entire noir era. Steve, let's don't talk about my brother. When Alexander McKendrick's Sweet Smell of Success emerged in 1957, it followed hot on the footsteps of Kubrick's The Killing and continued in the tradition of late era noir and its desire to bring the action to the city, a trend that began with Jules Dassin's earlier noir The Naked City, a cynical tale at its core. Here McKendrick tells the story of an authoritative newspaper columnist using his connections to ruin his sister's reputation with a man he deems unworthy of her. This was McKendrick's first film for an American studio prior to his departure from Ealing Studios, and from day one it seems that the paranoia and anxiety of his personal situation truly does make its way onto screen. There is a certain frantic tempo to the structure here, and it is known that shooting on location in New York City also added to McKendrick's anxieties, who was already having to deal with Burt Lancaster's volatile nature and his reputation for getting his directors fired. Although the experience of making Sweet Smell of Success was clearly a chaotic one for McKendrick, this does make for a rather distinctive noir, one that is always a step ahead of its audience, and a masterclass in how to craft a tangible crime atmosphere. In his final ever film for a Hollywood studio, Orson Welles sought to test and push the boundaries of the senses and his own directorial capabilities with his foreboding noir masterpiece, Touch of Evil, boasting a star-studded cast featuring Hollywood A-listers Charlton Heston, Janet Leigh, and Marlene Dietrich. 
Here we follow Heston as a Mexican police officer who investigates an explosion that killed two people near a border crossing. When he soon discovers that his police chief has begun to falsify evidence, the police officer soon tries to expose his chief, causing a violent and threatening reaction to arise. Heston, who was at a career peak during this period, featured in the film between his iconic roles in The Ten Commandments and Ben-Hur. And although Heston is perhaps the narrative thrust of this tale, it is Janet Leigh who truly shines within Touch of Evil, representing the brief ray of light present within Wells' world of disgust and repulsion. Claustrophobic and experimental in its close-ups, yet grandiose in its wide shots, Wells' vision here is nothing without Russell Meddy's iconic cinematography, which achieves a level of unfathomable magic and virtuosity from a budget of this kind. After revisiting this film for the first time in years, one will be captivated by Wells' approach to this timeless crime story, which blends its captivating pulpy aesthetic with an unparalleled level of thematic depth, taking into meticulous account the desires of Wells' memo. The reconstructed version of Touch of Evil earns its reputation within the context of cinema history as a formidable achievement in Wells' career, for this late golden era noir tale is also one of the genre's very best. The late 50s rise in television signalled the end of the movement of film noir as we knew it. And while some scholars maintain the argument that film noir never really ended, it is clear that many of the comparable films made outside the classic era truly can't be called genuine film noir. Illusions of what once was, the awareness of contemporary noir will always prevent it from standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the post-war influenced era of traditional noir. This was an era bound by its own rules and recognised foundations, and one where Hollywood tore up its own rulebook and conventionality making for some of the most multifaceted and darkest studies into humanity ever conceived by the studio system. If only we could see these tonal risks and narrative chances taken by the studios once again.